Hey everybody, this is Rhino and we're back to another live stream of Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel and video game news. Today is Wednesday, December 27th. So, we are now past the Christmas period. But we are still definitely in that middle gap between Christmas and New Year. So, there's basically no new notifications even for Yu-Gi-Oh which is always overabundant in the amount of notifications we have login rewards and da dual lives and daily rewards and that's pretty much it I'm at 4,000 gyms which is probably a safe space to stay at I don't probably probably wouldn't do well if I spent a bunch of those gyms and I have perhaps too many tin packs of these legacy tickets but inherently it also just kind of doesn't matter like none of these cards are ever going to be anything than perhaps slightly nostalgic if you remember like Dark Eyes Illusionist um, a lot of these cards definitely were on the concept of the flip effect and the flip effect has long since abandoned it is definitely an effect you could just eliminate and ban from the game and it would ban probably three or four thousand cards um, but none of them would have really been playable in a tournament style anyways I am still getting new cards of this collection but the, the problem, and I think this is a problem with any collectible card game or trading card game. And as I was speculating on Christmas uh, in the last stream, as far as what would I try to do if I was going to make a new card game, I definitely would think that there needs to be more value in each individual card. Uh, that is something that is just kind of absolutely non-existent that the, the need to make people buy more packs and buy more cards makes individual cards incredibly worthless either at launch in a lot of cases land cards that produce one mana in magic the gathering still getting those 35 years and it feels like magic's been around for 35 years uh, later it's kind of ridiculous you'd buy a booster pack and still get land cards um, there, there really should just be a starter set that gives you land cards uh, and that's it uh, but then also you have cards that may be very playable at the current launch of an expansion but then eventually just stop being playable after a year or two um, noticeably there really isn't an incredibly overpowered card like Black Lotus in Yu-Gi-Oh that people talk about but noticeably also Black Lotus is about the only card that anybody talks about in any trading card game as far as just being incredibly overpowerful or valuable because it's overpowered but yeah we can see of the 4034 cards that are in this collection I could roughly estimate I probably have 60 to 75 percent of them at least one copy of them and we'll just continuously get these legacy cards whether you want them or not so it's really just going to be a much longer journey before you got to the point where you have at least three copies of legacy cards and then could start dismantling the legacy cards um, ideally you would want as you get more cards a higher chance of getting things you don't have and it's kind of crazy I don't have this card here the blast sphere not that it's really playable these are all very much that first anime generation of Yu-Gi-Oh cards these are cards you definitely are likely to have seen either in the first anime series or the perhaps second anime series they're up to the fifth anime series now, although technically the fifth one really isn't playing Yu-Gi-Oh! anymore. Instead, it's playing 
a different game called Yu-Gi-Oh! Rush. Which, yeah. Maybe I would be willing to give that a chance. Hmm. This Duelist Cup has ended, so we really can just play ranked today. So we'll just hump, hop into this. Uh, Christmas happened. Not a lot, really, to say about it. Um, a slick deal sale came out the next day to for a refrigerator, and I needed to replace my probably 14-year-old, if not 15-year-old refrigerator. Um, it still works, but it's not paying particularly great, as you would imagine, and I'm, I imagine the energy efficiency is particularly bad, even though I'm just replacing it with another probably particularly bad uh, and low in, in, and not very efficient in refrigerator. In fairness, while it would be nice to have an energy efficient refrigerator, you're probably not going to really do great with that. The, the better something can claim it's energy efficient, the more likely it's going to be switching on and off the cooling part. Um, and have more just electronics in general in it that can break where the cheapest white refrigerator freezer on top uh, that you can see in the store is really the recommended one that I've seen from at least one online uh, appliance repair person unless you're just desperately rich and, and want to spend six thousand dollars on a refrigerator then by all means get one with a tv screen on the front of it if that's where you want to waste your money there is an argument i i think to having a plumbed ice making machine and water filters and water dispenser and i have a smaller secondary refrigerator that has all of that um that had to be smaller to fit in the alcove which was not designed correctly it's not deep enough it's very good job and i've used that quite a bit and, and i'm a little surprised i've used it quite a bit as far as just i'm drinking a, a lot more water because of an ice machine because of a freezer uh water filter um and so yeah you can definitely get on a healthier lifestyle and it might very well be worth it to spend not four thousand dollars but maybe two thousand dollars to get a refrigerator that has an ice maker and a ice dispenser and a um and a water filter with a water dispenser um, but yeah i've been needing to do it i've had a six deals alert for a refrigerator um going with black instead of white as the color that'll be interesting it, it does make a certain argument certainly as far as the reason why you, it's recommended to get black cars if you're particularly if you're in a colder weather environment where it never really gets that hot is that it hides dirt and dust a lot better so you don't feel an extra need to wash your car as often um, but when you're getting a black refrigerator if there is dirt or dust or junk or things on the surface of your or, or the outside surface at least of your refrigerator you probably don't want it there you probably don't want a dirty outside of your refrigerator so i'll have to be careful to make sure it's clean even though it is going to be black instead of white uh in fairness my 14 year old white refrigerator definitely showed yellowing in the plastic and just in general yelling yellowing from dirt and grime and probably sad to say that people not washing their hands well enough and touching things um, I think if you go long enough and you're not cleaning things on at least a monthly basis what's kind of a bleach product you will start to see yellowing on white surfaces I have a bunch of walls that probably need the paint scraped off and repainted because there's dirt and all on them um, but I spray them with bleach and things so I, I know that they may be sanitary but they're not pleasant to look and that's a big difference that 
cleaning encompasses two different things. You can have something that is absolutely sanitary. Um, the the argument is urine is quote unquote sterile and sanitary as it's coming out of the human body. So you won't really get sick if you straight up just ingested urine, and some people actually do. Um, for a couple of different reasons, I won't mention, but but it's also not visually appealing, certainly, and not desirable by a lot of people, certainly. So th there is an appearance of cleaning this. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm gonna mute myself and cough some more. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. So, yeah, there's an appearance of cleanliness that you probably want when you're cleaning. You want things that are white to be bright white and as good as the day you got them. And you want any other color to be that color as far as the day you got them. Um, but you can certainly have something appear clean and be crawling with germs. And viruses and bacteria it can be incredibly unhygienic and unsanitary and then you have sanitary and you can sanitize quite a lot and that doesn't inherently mean it's going to look good um, one example of that is if you burnt all food to just a pile of carbon it would be sanitary but if you burnt all food to a pile of carbon, it, it wouldn't really be digestible or helpful. Hmm. So you, you're sinking both when you are um, when you are trying to have something clean, and it can definitely be a struggle at times to accomplish both. Particularly if you're not consistently working um, on a surface very often. Like cleaning a toilet weekly, or if not several times a week, really is necessary, even if it doesn't seem like it's necessary, just to to not have any grime or dirt or things build up. Cleaning cloths and tablecloths and napkins, uh, if you've spilled food on them in quickly, is very necessary because if you don't do that, stains will set in the fabric. <laughs> so yeah, I guess that was a long and boring way to say I bought, bought a refrigerator. As far as like games go, well, now I'm not going to buy myself any Steam games after buying a refrigerator. The, the deal is good and um, generally I, I'm not really caring at the low end about brands, but it's, it's a, I want to say Medea, that's probably not how you pronounce the brand, um, refrigerator from Lowe's. And it's selling for like starting at $488 shipping and delivery and taxes and, and take away if you have other um, a, a existing refrigerator. We'll bump that up a little bit. But yeah, it's selling for about $488. It says it's that's about $300 off. So you're, you're approaching 30, 30, maybe even 40% off. Um, but I would also question if it hadn't just been marked up. It going on sale the day after Christmas. 
implies to me that there is a there wasn't as many orders as they had hoped and they're trying to clear it out at the end of the year this wasn't a front page slick deals offer um, but I uh, did have just the word refrigerator marked as email me if good refrigerator deals pop up and I've been looking for probably two and a half years and there just really haven't been any sales appliance sales refrigerator sales probably don't usually go on sale around Christmas as much as they usually go on sale closer to Labor Day and there were some sales for other refrigerators it's not like there was zero but they were more expensive refrigerators being discounted a couple of hundred dollars so you still end up paying twelve hundred dollars or more for fancier refrigerators that you just really don't need <laughs> yep but obviously I won't buy any games and the, the only thing I did get was that there was an earlier slick deals for an Xbox controller so I have another a new Xbox controller that I can cycle in when I get back to playing video games which who knows when that will be at this rate um, speaking of that as far as the accountability section I am still working on my smart on air sign which I could basically say every single stream for the past three months uh, it feels like it probably really hasn't been a full three months yet but I was having a connectivity issue where it was connecting but then it wasn't recognizing that it got a message and then it was sending the timeout message eventually I realized it is what it was doing. Um, turns out on the expressive IDF and probably the code I'm using that, that simplifies connecting to a WebSocket um, server to OBS's WebSocket server it's probably not that well optimized would be my guess and in general there is almost certainly a difference in what is normally expected as far as the response from something versus what how slow a connection could be over the Wi-Fi yes we have very fast Wi-Fi these days compared to the past but no Wi-Fi is really nowhere close uh, as far as the data speeds could be as far as internal connections to other things the internal connection for a SATA 3 SSD the old internal hard drive connection standard was 6 gigabits per second we're not getting anywhere close to 6 gigabits per second on Wi-Fi in the best case scenario you're getting four maybe 600 megabits per second a, a tenth of that at most so rather slow but yeah in the express IDF there's a couple places where you can optimize the bootloader when you build it for debugging which is the default setting or you can optimize it for speed turns out if you don't change it in the, at least the application optimization um, then to speed it's just the program's just not running fast enough to receive the message and connect um, so it literally was a single setting in the collection of several DOS based settings you can change in building the software and yes this is all I'm pretty sure these optimizations are literally C++ compiler optimizations which yeah it doesn't for a relatively small program it doesn't really matter to optimize for speed it still takes a, a minute at most to compile the bootloader in the program it's not really that that difficult um, the optimization is probably just unrolling a bunch of loops and moving the machine code the assembly code around to, to make it speed, speedier um, but yeah I guess in general you probably should make sure your compilers are always optimizing for speed 
but you really would never notice either. The, the only reason you, you're noticing on an ESP32 is because an ESP32 is running at 160 megahertz at most, whereas your regular computer, you can easily assume that each thread is going to be at six, seven hundred megahertz each with two threads per core and at least four cores. So you're, you're talking eight threads to at least at, at minimum in any modern computer, even even in the case of cell phones, which would be a whole different thing as far as programming a mobile app you can pretty much expect that it's going to be at least a dual core probably with four threads in that case on cell phone architecture um, obviously cell phones are fast enough to connect to web servers and, and wi-fi access points So, yeah, by figuring out that, which took a lot of research as to why one line of code would just stop working when it was working before with the Arduino compiler, um, I am just conti didn't make as much progress as I would have liked. Um, in general, I think that the, I'm just not moving as fast or spending as much time on it. Um, just probably to be expected around the Christmas season. Um, watching TV still. Sanctuary. It's what I'm mostly still focusing on. Although I've gotten back to watching Surreal Real Estate on Hulu, which is a interesting premise of a more modern sci-fi show. Um, why I'm watching sci-fi shows makes no sense, though, at all. Um, the problem with the real, real estate, I think, is the car the actors, the main actor in particular, is a dead fish, and uh, the main male protagonist is a dead fish as, as far as the character goes, and I think he hurts the show severely. I think the other characters could be interesting, but they all have really not come into their prime. And that is a problem with TV shows, too, is that you... Second season, third season, um, before characters actually start to matter. As far as Sanctuary goes, they, they're almost constantly getting rid of a character or playing with who, who, which characters are really getting a lot of air time. And watching Sanctuary on Freevium turned into a bit of a frustration because I've been watching it and I had not been really paying attention to individual episodes so I'm probably only getting uh, maybe 60% of the episodes in which I'm paying attention to them or getting the general gist of it but but there is kind of a continuing thing in each season and so they did this cliffhanger on season three or see at the end of season two and then Freemium doesn't have season 3, it just jumps to season 4. So, there, there literally is a point where you're, uh, it says to be continued after a giant spider nearly just, it, it looks like it's going to destroy the world. And then it skips from that point, skipping all of season 3, which would have resolved that, or at least resolved it in the first episode or something. Um... To a season four where there's this entire city called Praxis that's been in introduced and destroyed in season three and you you can't see on freemium any of that you can see it on the Roku channel and I guess I, I probably should just pull up the episodes on the Roku channel with ads but that that could be a real pain with freemium if they just don't have all the episodes or if they're missing a middle episode that's the craziest part is to be missing a middle episode middle season um but yeah in season four there's this whole hollow earth revelation where a bunch more cryptids which is what sanctuary is about it's about fighting cryptids frankly more than um than saving them and giving them sanctuary 
Um, so a whole bunch of new cryptids are introduced from this, this Hollow Earth concept. Um, and it definitely has a lot of Iraqi war overtones. And it's a great example in season four of TV shows being influenced by what was happening around the time when the show aired and they were effectively doing political in and uh, analogies talking about Guantanamo Bay and things like that and, and now in retrospect that just ruins a show as far as rewatching of course when Sanctuary is being made I imagine they didn't really expect that there ever would be a market to watch old shows more than just reruns on TV. They didn't think of things like Netflix not being a thing. But yeah, Sanctuary, if they had some interesting story to tell around the Iraq War and terrorism and Guantanamo Bay and things like that, that'd be one thing, but they really don't. But by introducing that concept, they've now ever increased the fact that they are fighting cryptids instead of like protecting cryptids in the sanctuary, which has turned almost every episode into fighting cryptids or fighting humans who are trying to capture cryptids. making it much much too much of an action show and less of a discovery whodunit show or a adventure show where you're introduced to new characters or and in season four they're just reintroducing a lot of characters that they had already CG animated or costumes they had made from previous seasons hmm. so yeah sanctuary got on wars. It was pretty bad throughout it. But I really have run out of opportunities to watch anything new. Um, well, surreal real estate is new to me, but it's not great either. So I'm really scraping the bottom of the barrel as far as watching TV. I've not watched any more of Ghost Whisperer. Which I was only paying attention to probably about 30% of those episodes. Uh, and that show is, is just absolutely wonderful. So, yeah, uh, as far as the accountability section, it's. It's stupid that uh, I'm watching a lot of TV and most of the TV I'm watching is really bad. It probably makes an argument to spend a few extra bucks and get a better streaming service if such a thing actually existed. But it really isn't the money at the moment. It, it is a case of I don't want to just pay for Dis Disney Plus to watch Mandalorian and Loki and nothing else uh, and I don't want to pay for Paramount Plus just to watch a Star Trek series I probably don't even care about um, and HBO Max has perhaps the best offering as as a concept but I've never really been super interested in any of the HBO shows either. Like, I don't think I really would bother to sit through Game of Thrones. Um, so yeah, I really shouldn't be watching any of it. But I, just, but I clearly have some desire or need to take breaks while programming. And perhaps I'm taking too many breaks yes but that that I still need some of that I need I need some downtime uh, I definitely get into situations where I'm sitting up in my chair and the chair gets uncomfortable and I need to move and lay down 
in the bed instead and yeah sometimes I try and program in that but then also there are definitely times where I've been just programming too much for too long and my brain is tired so I either I, I typically am at that time turning on a streaming service and watching a TV show instead and yeah, I'm also playing on my phone, so I'm multitasking quite a bit while watching a streaming service. Um, still playing Star Trek Lower Decks, but they they had the gall, really, and, and I can't call it anything else than gall, to put out a notification on Star Trek Lower Decks on mobile to just say they were completely out of new events on top of them being really slow to release any new episodes so they, they basically for me at least are saying there will be no new content at all until sometime in January and it, it definitely felt like it was mid January or late January I've already said as far as Star Trek Lower Deck since I've just maxed out things in that game very quickly I really have only been playing the game like six months and, and I think anybody who spent any money in that game would be incredibly disappointed because wailing to the end and then just having no end game concept at all is not acceptable as far as the way to design games with in-app content. Um, really the, the game very easily should just have an ascension level rank where once you get to the end you just ascend to that level and create a new save file or or start all over again. Uh, noticeably too, since you're getting story elements as you go through the main game, there's no way to see that story content a second time. So if you missed it, you just missed it. Which is no way to certainly optimize the space usage on people's cell phones to have data and screens that you just can never go back and look at. I suspect I'm going to get disconnect victory here. Either that or this person is just hoping that I get bored. Um, I'm still getting the pop-ups as far as that phishing virus. So I did choose to start a full system scan to see if that would fix things. Um, and that's running, but it's going to take like three hours, so, yeah. It's probably not a smart move to stream and record while scanning your whole system. That might put a little more pressure on the CPU than you'd like, but it's more than likely going to be fine. Um, but yeah, Star Trek Rolodex, I've already said... As soon as that next episode comes out, I'm going to have so much resources just built up and ready to go that I'll probably finish the new content, if not in a day, in a couple of days, and then I'll have nothing new to do with it, and that's almost certainly the point where I'll pull the trigger and just stop playing Star Trek Lower Decks. Uh, as for other the other games I'm playing Memento Mori is still giving out rewards for the New Year's and Christmas and, and adding content very well there is a slight concern of just stagnation and it, I've always kind of had this concern with a stagnation element to Memento Mori where you hit a certain level and then it just becomes really really difficult and it's taking potentially entire weeks if not months uh, to upgrade characters high enough well enough to um, to make any progress any further and there's a lot of storyline content that is kind of locked at least in world 14 behind some high difficulty levels which arguably if you just want to see storyline content, it probably makes a lot of sense to to 
either start with the newest world or start with the oldest world. It might make a lot of sense to start with the oldest world, world one, um, because things probably are a lot easier to see the storyline content. But then in other ways, I think it might be easier to start with the newest world, which would be World 16. And they had a new world pretty much every month. Which is an intriguing mechanic, to say the least. Uh, there's the story, as far as I understand it. I haven't reached that point yet. Eventually gets to a, to a point where the main protagonist and the characters get sent to a different dimension and instead of them introducing a lot of new characters they are introducing alternate versions of existing characters. Uh, which on some levels, level that's fine, but on some level that can be annoying too. When you compare that to Destiny Child, Destiny Child was introducing three or four new gacha characters you could collect every month, whereas um, feels like Memento Mori maybe is introducing one or two a month, and Destiny Child really didn't do different versions, different skins of existing characters very often. They did it for like the three main starter characters. A couple times so there, there might have been like three versions of each of the three main starter characters uh, but for the most part that was it um, most other characters would not have different versions of their characters they would all the characters in Destiny Child had different skins that you could unlock so there, there definitely was a lot more art um, it was made for Destiny Child, and in its five years, Destiny Child had so many characters in comparison to Memento Mori, which Memento Mori has about 36, where I imagine after the first year of Destiny Child, there probably was 136 or more characters. Just because they started off with a lot more, and it was just easier to get the characters but that did make a lot of trash characters to get back to the comparison which I could definitely compare to train card games as far as what's the point of having a hundred characters if really you only cared about five or ten of them Memento Mori really only has four garbage tier characters that exist and then and that's fine they, they don't need to add any more garbage to our character, uh, characters. It would be nice if they perhaps had more newer characters and solely focused on new characters for the first couple of years. But it may integrate into the story a lot more. And it was generally the concept too is even at the beginning of the game you have some bad, bad girl, bad guy characters that were bad guy and then you defeat them and then they become good guys uh, so taking some of the characters and showing what would have happened in the story had you not defeated them and saved them in one way or the other had they just continued down the path of being bad guys or had they never been bad guys before and became bad guys that's still very much within the story but i would say the experience of playing memento mori is still fairly frustrating in that i wake up in the morning and i do practically everything i can do for the entire game in just 10 minutes 20 minutes the fact that i have two save files now and and i could probably pretty easily have a third save file speaks to just how low there is actually to do because so much of it is out of it. Um, as far as the other mobile games uh, and I might as well warn that there's not going to be a lot of video game news today because there just isn't any news that's being 
reported, probably because all the new parts have taken off more than anything. Um, Tinka Fuma, which maybe is actually Tinka Fu MA, as in mature audiences. Um, I, I looked at the spelling and I'm like, oh yeah, that might very well be the case. So, on some storefront, there might be a game called Tinka Fu that doesn't have any adult content in it. Although, in fairness, if it didn't have any adult content in it, then there, there would just not be a game there. The story is so incredibly wrapped around that. Um, but it's having its Christmas events and it's staggering the releases of a lot of its Christmas events. So you do have to come back every couple days when the events unlock. Uh, the main story I think I've already maxed out. But that the events still are happening and there's still something to do every day a couple times a day if you really want to and then seven mortal sins ecstasy i got bored enough to actually start playing that and, and try and move the story forward a little bit and it's a it's a little it's still very exhausting there's, there's just way too many daily events and things to do there's about 10 daily free summons when really there should be one or two daily free summons. There's probably about 20 daily challenges for so many events happening. The story's not interesting enough, either in the events or in the uh, case of the the main story. Just way too many items, way too many events, and eventually I imagine I will just get tired of Seven Mortal Sins because it's just so exhausting. Although maybe not because there is that chance certainly that what happens is I finish up with Star Trek Lower Decks and then I'm just looking for some other thing to take up my time. This is an example of doing too much. Probably didn't need to activate that since it's just gonna send the card back. Just going full cycle here. Nope, nope, nope. Don't want to do that. Darn it. That was a mistake. And apparently after activating the effect you can't undo that, so I totally boned that up. I could have been very close to a victory and 
put all that effort into it and then just screwed it all up. Um, yeah, the only thing really I need to do now that I've got the program flashing and installing with the ESP IDF, the only thing I say, um, the next thing is, is I need to get the encryption working for the handshake back. I, I had changed that. I probably need to just change it back to what it was, or but I want to do a little bit of experiment to see if I can use the built-in libraries just continuously trying to make everything work with the built-in libraries if they can work otherwise use the header files if you have to use the header files and the libraries um, but yeah i'd like the, everything to be using the embedded esp idf code if there is code version library built in because more than likely that code will then just seamlessly transition to the to the next version of ESP IDF, which yeah, that's gonna be a nightmare. Rewriting the code if I bother to do that ever in the future. But after accomplishing that and just making sure everything works well and I've got the HTML set up the way I want it. I, w I will be very much back to where I was probably a month and a half ago where I'm back to just making sure I can get the application encrypted and, and the secure boot installed on it so people can't steal the code. Um, there is a thought certainly I had as far as making a programmer with a Raspberry Pi, which is definitely a plan. Um, but then having the programmer's program potentially be stolen. So I don't know if there's some full disk encryption I need to do on a Linux build on the Raspberry Pi too. Because it, it would be fairly easy to just take a micro SD card out of a Raspberry Pi programmer and copy that over. So even if they couldn't get the files, they could still still use it. Even if they couldn't decrypt the files and change the code. These theoretical thieves of a product which definitely do exist I ordered a different oh off the shelf on air sign to put the chip in it is a little bit cheaper and so I want to look at the internals of that and make sure the same concept would work. And then one of the problems I, I recognized I was having is that I had set up a emergency um, reset of everything if the, the default password was lost. And since it was reading data that could be sent through a couple pins that I was using for something else, me just handling the chip and touching either the reception or transmission of it was triggering the code, uh, which is interesting, but that would work at all. Um, and it really would only work on those two pins. Uh, but those two pins are also the pins I want to use because they'll be the easiest to solder to, and that is definitely a big concern. Um, um, but yeah, so I'm going to have to experiment with rewriting the code to make sure it checks not just for any signal, but checks for an actual specific character. 
So instead of it being booby trapped to reset if anybody sends any code at all, it'll now only reset if somebody types the letter R, which is still fine. Like, didn't really need to be booby trapped. It just was the way I'd written things to make it simplistic enough. It still, as far as I know, would not receive any other signals. I mean, there, there wouldn't be a way somebody could connect to the chip and send it commands or anything. But yeah. But that was a slightly confusing issue, certainly, is every time I would pick up the chip to uh, to reset it, it would look like it was getting short-circuited and resetting when actually it was triggering code that told it to reset after formatting all the information and all the information was going away and I was like why is the information going away am I literally short circuiting this or is one of the helper libraries looking for a signal when I touch a pen which yeah if, a, if one of those pins was being held to a high 5 volt level it was being held high when you touched it and you're grounded, there's a decent chance you could pull it low and trigger something. A lot of the pins on the ESP32 style chips are designed to have a capacitive sensor on them and a touch sensor, so you can literally just touch the, touch a single pin. Also, all the pins are very close to each other, so it's very possible that you could touch one pin and then take the high voltage from one pin to a low grounded voltage. Um, of another pin and short circuit it that way. I suppose technically if you were electrified at 5 volts, if your fingers were, then um, that could take a low pin and bring it high. That's not likely that would be the case. Unless you're actively being electrocuted, I guess yeah, that would be the case. But yeah, a lot of extra debugging is still happening. And that that's the problem is I've really got nobody to test these in a day-to-day -day case. And so something can happen like, I'm, I'm really not 100% sure that the code at the moment doesn't at some point just fail and get tired and stop doing what it should be doing. Well, in the case of a smart on-air sign, you would expect it really has to just stay connected always for days, days, weeks, months, years without any problems. It has to constantly make sure to receive any signals if you start recording or you start streaming and light up and receive signals which all those signals actually come from OBS and your computer so it really is just waking up and seeing if there are any new signals and going back to sleep uh, for the vast majority of the time it should be running but it has to do that loop over and over again uh, 20 seconds or so it isn't doing too much at that point but but that that's what it's gotta do and it's gonna not have some weird reason why it stops then I have to make sure all of the setup procedure works when it is supposed to work and doesn't work when it's not supposed to work And in general, I'm just trying to optimize the code too. I did move all of the instructions into its own separate header file. It's not quite to the point where I where the instructions could be converted directly from HTML 
to just t plain text or the award document, but it is in its own file. And so that removes several hundred lines of code that were just text, just HTML text of the instructions. So when I'm looking at the code now, I'm not having to scroll past hundreds of lines of code. Ninja, no, I'm just trying to optimize the code. And not really capable of optimizing the code much either. I'm going to stop talking about this in a second. Um, I imagine this is boring people, or people don't even know what I'm talking about. Um, but yep. Because there's just this plan and steps and code have, has already been written, even if it's just being commented out at the moment, to move to the ESP IDF version 5 and 4, there's a lot of code that is just in the middle commented out, um, taking up extra lines. Whereas if I truly tried to just optimize the code, probably get it down from 500 to 400, maybe even 300 lines of code. And ideally, if you can, if you have a simplistic enough program to do that, that's what you want to have happen is you don't want just a long-winded program that just goes on forever and ever. And it's difficult to read and difficult to understand and work with. Uh, in particular, the regulations, at least at one time, for writing code for NASA were incredibly strict in that way, in that you basically could have only functions that did one thing and only one thing. And all, all of a function could only be on like one pa piece of paper, one page of paper. That you, you just, they, they wanted it incredibly easy to read and understand and simplistic. They, they could not have mistakes, they could not have errors. Um, which, even in those strict rulings and rules, it, didn't really always work out. I, I there definitely are stories in um, of the code going bad and breaking in the computers uh, in some of the spaceships uh, early time, early spaceships. And even now, Voyager Two they think is broken and is, it very well may be broken because of code. They really need redundancies on top of redundancies on, on top of redundancies. And see, the security just popped up right now saying a virus and threat was detected again. It, it's some page that is auto reloading and the only thing I have even open that I'm looking at right now is Twitter, but that doesn't inherently mean it's Twitter because it could be just about any page getting refreshed. I would still assume it's GameDeveloper.com. Oh, and I guess I should say, for the accountability section, I also spent some time cleaning up the follow list since that page was open and worked. Um, yeah. And there was a fairly significant amount of games on the fall list that could be easily dismissed. Generally, I'm, I'm looking at anything from like March or earlier of 2023 and saying if that, if that game doesn't have 30 reviews, it, it should just be eliminated. Um, but yeah. I'm going to inherently need to clean up the wish list after I clean up the follow list. And there is probably a level of 
different styles of games that I could probably give up on in the wishlist also. Because th there are arguments to go through the wishlist and just say, hey, let's just look at all the fighting games and all the visual novels and, and let's just let's well, let's just look at fighting games only and filter the wish list to get to, get it down to five to twenty fighting games you really want to play versus um, versus potentially having hundreds of fighting games. It's probably a bad trade to make, but whatever. So, yeah, in the past couple of days, I've actually made a decent amount of progress. Sorry, cracking my knuckles down to the microphone. Um, I don't have a terrible habit of that. Like, with having a little bit of arthritis in my hands already, my knuckles generally tend to crack just by uh, usual usage of opening and closing my fingers. Um, I have toes that have a lot of buildup, so I can, if I close my toes and open my toes, I can crack them multiple times in a row. Alright, so on that hour long rambling, I think I'm ready to talk about news and warmed up enough. I have been fairly consistent in the past couple streams as, as far as streaming early in the morning. Uh, this is in the hopes to accomplish more later in the day, which that really won't be the case. Uh, the refrigerator I ordered is going to be delivered tomorrow so I'll probably not accomplish much tomorrow. I'll probably have to wake up and then sit around waiting for the delivery man. No, I, they don't even have have a scheduled time yet. So I may wake up at 6, 7, 8 in the morning and be waiting for them in the late in the evening. Um, But yeah, they're just having taken a couple days off from programming and now feeling like I lost momentum and now I'm moving slower as far as programming on the Smart Hunt Air site really highlights that I just am not in a position where I can mentally take a break and play a video game. I'd like to play a video game though. Like, uh, I definitely am getting that twinge, and the more I can build up that twinge, the better, but yeah, I really would like to play a video game, make some pre-recorded footage, probably need to schedule footage and upload footage too, um, that's all definitely a concern. Um, I am definitely at a point where having another 30 days of YouTube Shorts scheduled makes sense and basically need to do that every end of the month or so ideally you would do it on the 30th of every day every month for the next 30 days weirdly i've been getting a decent amount of views on my live stream and i've been getting a decent amount of views on the legend of bumbo I kind of wish I had made The Legend of Bumbo better footage, frankly. It, it's something that I probably could have stuck with a little bit more and played more often instead of playing things off screen. Um, it's definitely something where I didn't unlock everything I would have liked to unlock just in the game in general. Um, but. Definitely didn't want to treat The Legend of Bumbo like The Binding Wiser uh, and the way I covered that when I first started my channel over 10 years ago, it feels like. Um, like that. 
pro my channel probably is only closer to five than ten years old. No. I'll just stick with calling it ten years old. Oh. But yeah, I didn't want to do full long play of Bumbo and just ramble like crazy. Which, that's where these live streams really came from, is that this, this was the place to play a game I didn't particularly care about that much as far as making footage or, and don't, what wasn't ever going to have a significant amount of criticism to say about Yu-Gi-Oh! Like, not, not after playing it for so long, but I continuously have new ideas and new criticisms to make. And yeah, I think the live streams work a lot better for that reason. I don't know if they particularly work great as far as getting more viewers or more subscribers, but they, they definitely help. Uh, they help more than the pre-recorded footages does. So, yeah. It does it, it does make some sense, or it did make some sense when recording Le Legend of Bumbo to play off screen and, and do entire runs over and over again where no progress has been made. I think even compared to Binding of Isaac, there is a higher case of that happening where You'll have an entire run in Bumbo that just doesn't matter. Um, or the Binding of Isaac, at least in its early s versions, usually you're making some level of progress. You you have a chance of running into a random item. You've got pennies you can put into the bank to unlock things by putting money into the bank until you get it all the way to a dollar. dollar or a thousand pennies and then it blows up. Um, but yeah, Legend of Bumbo doesn't really have a penny bank. It, it doesn't really have anything progressive if you're not defeating the levels with specific characters. And when you defeat the levels with specific characters, then you might unlock new character but there's only like five characters in Legend of Bumbo and all. <clears throat> Still not really making any progress as far as polymerization and it definitely would make some sense to just make a polymerization deck and play that. That way we could get the daily quest done and well, we already got the daily quest done. We could get the proficiency quest done. So, yeah. Could play in solo mode. If I got really bored. I could make some footage that way. Of course, any footage I make potentially spills up my hard drive until I upload it. Um, The dual pass doesn't end until 41 days, so that's not really a concern. And, and we still basically are in that 4,000 range as far as gems go. Alright, so let's go through the news, or at least the big news. There really wasn't a lot of big news. Full Metal Alchemist Mobile is going to end service on March 29th, 2024. Um, ending less than two years of service In inherently i've seen people claim that most video mobile games fail in the first three years this seems to be in less than two years uh, now notably full metal alchemist either the original one or brotherhood uh, or the manga which was still going when the original full metal alchemist movie or the movies, um, which I think there's two, maybe three of them. All of those 
forms of entertainment though are fairly old like full metal alchemist is definitely not an anime that people are talking about as far as this is something you've got to see if you've never seen it or this is something you've likely um would watch for friends for a second watch even the animation style is a little off from what you would see these days so yeah it, it definitely feels like they were probably too late to the party and it definitely feels like this gives a hint that you can't just make a mobile game and slap an old intellectual property on it now if it's something like pokemon that's constantly got new content on it that's fine or if it's dragon ball where people are crazy about dragon ball that's fine um but even i think half the dragon ball games fail and the pokemon mobile games have yet to really succeed so it definitely also makes an argument towards the idea of having those production companies and having a plan to release a mobile game as the anime as the manga as the movies are all coming out as the audiobook comes out as the art book gets released just that transmedia barrage makes some sense if it succeeds probably the the plan should be to have a phase one to make something popular and then very quickly have everything else made around that phase one but it really isn't a good way to do that you can't just snap your fingers and make a mobile game it's going to take years of development before um, before you can release it unless you just have mobile games you can swap skins in which eventually we probably will see a game like that where the, it, it is very obviously a case where they've just swapped in characters into some mobile game that otherwise would have just been a generic mobile game weirdly i would also say that full metal alchemist as a mobile game probably wasn't an alchemy game it probably wasn't focused around collecting resources and performing alchemy because the concept of alchemy in full metal alchemist kind of gets thrown out the window and it becomes much more of a action beat em up game that would be better suited to make just your standard rpg style game around it uh platinum games put out kind of a weird tweet at least to foreigners uh, another year is coming to the end in japan it's customary to clean one's home and workplaces as part of the osoji literally big clean Platinum Games staff are no exception and clean the studios themselves every December. And this is probably a great example of how Japanese culture has been built on the concept of exploitation. <laughs> um, inherently, I think the Japanese culture having an emperor, having that feudal system definitely has a lot of remnants of the feudal idea of peasants being exploited being forced to to work harder for no reason but the japanese really have made that part of their culture and probably big uh, actually feel like that's a smart idea in the same way i would say people in the united states have the culture of capitalism and the pull pull yourself up by the bootstraps mentality uh, built into them and they they think that's something that they just thought of or that they think that's a great thing um, the anti-communist and red scare uh, feelings still prominent in the United States too um, and so inherently people's cultures can be based on things that aren't probably the best for them whereas in the United States it is almost certainly not my job not my job not in people's jobs description to clean the offices uh, Japanese people tend to be clean freaks anyways and this is also 
definitely instilled in the Japanese citizens through the exploitation that happens in Japanese schools, in which Japanese schools barely have any staff at all. Like, they, 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 many of them have a janitor that does very little work or don't have a janitor at all. The students, even at a very young age, uh, first grade, second grade, third grade, are expected to clean the bathrooms themselves, um, which maybe encourages the bathrooms to stay a little bit cleaner, but also is almost certainly not sanitary uh, and really just antithetical to spending your time wisely as far as having kids be educated in school instead of being used as free labor in school school also you're not creating as many jobs in that way and one of the major problems in japan is that there aren't as many job opportunities as there really should be uh, particularly outside of japan if japan literally just passed a law saying the students cannot be used for free labor and every school system throughout all of japan in the smaller cities and such all had to hire a janitor at that point uh, that would create a decent amount of jobs but yeah this is probably something better not mentioned and there's a video here and I assume this is gonna be a video of them cleaning so we can get direct images of being filmed as far as their dusting washing windows vacuuming, lint brushing couches, uh, hand cleaning dolls. Of course, this is all being done as a video. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if the employees are being forced or happily engaging in their own exploitation. And really, this is exploitation. That's that's the word to use and, and to think of. Um, as far as being forced to clean the bathrooms at the office um, and I wouldn't be surprised if part of the cleans also has programmers people who are artists people who are not in their job description supposed to be lifting or doing physical labor I wouldn't be surprised if they they're having them move things around and, and clean out the offices as far as moving furniture around to clean or just removing boxes of things uh, physical manual labor uh, yeah it does create the situation where Japan is known for being extremely clean perhaps to a fault when you have this level of, of exploitation and maybe you even see the boss helping out so Maybe it is a little bit of team building, but I, I definitely wouldn't be happy if this was part of the culture in the United States and, and people were just happily doing something that wasn't in their job description. Even from an outside looking in, I, I'm not particularly happy on the idea of that even one day at Platinum Games, the employees are cleaning their offices instead of using their much higher mental talent to think about the next Bayonetta or next Platinum game they're going to make. Um, it's one thing to have a culture of cleaning your own home. It's a, another thing to say workplaces or outside general things. A lot of Japanese kids picking up trash that is just on the street instead of a city having a project. And I don't want to get too gross here, but there's plenty of stories that are based in reality in the West of there being somebody who is just incredibly gross, intentionally or otherwise, in the bathrooms. And um, either they're doing it just to be gross, just because they hate people and they hate life in general, or they're doing it to, to get back at a bad boss. Um, but there, there is the phrase the phantom pooper i'll censor it and call it the phantom pooper that is has been used to describe it in several job stories i've heard where it's just one person they can never really figure out who it is who is 
almost painting the walls with poop in the bathroom and just making a huge mess. In all fairness, there are people with disabilities and and that can make a mess, but most of them, I think, make a real effort to clean up after any mess they make. To just leave it is is another step, certainly. But yeah, when you have potentially that kind of phantom pooper in an office and then the employees are being asked it even one day out of the year to clean clean the um, office that's not particularly fair and even if we got away from bathrooms there, there might literally just be a boss or a fellow employee even at platinum games that is just dirty leaves garbage has a horrible work workstation um, probably not in Japan but definitely could be the case and having other employees have to pull up the slack or clean for another employees is the opposite of team building it's going to create resentment noticeably though there's not a lot of news there just kind of a weird thing for platinum games to put out in english um per particularly without like localizing or translating it we we see all these censored uh, complaints about localization uh, in video games but to a certain level that there is the opposite argument where the Japanese can can come off as weird perhaps not misunderstood by their cultures and their exploitation culture uh, and they they would come off better if they censored themselves if they localized things to say something else although in this case censorship would only be hiding the truth and that's the problem with censorship a lot of times it's if you did localize something so it sounded better to a westerner's ear to a united states citizen's ear but really you're just lying to them because you've used yellow journalism to slightly change the words to make it seem less than what it actually is that that's not good either if a genocide is happening and and somebody calls it a massacre instead that but it really is a genocide that that's not helpful to really anybody other than the people committing the genocide trying not to get in trouble for committing the genocide Centered Gaming seems like he's had a burst of productivity, which would make sense, certainly, during the Christmas season. Um, I haven't watched this video yet, but one of the things censored in the Final Fantasy VII Remake, uh, I believe this was, this is in the second part of the Final Fantasy Remake, uh, was how this honeybee dance show was toned down to the age ratings in the original game you didn't have this high level of of detail in the game it would have been low polygon uh, 3d characters uh, and I believe if not in this section in it, there, there definitely is a section where uh, in the original game the main character, the main male protagonist, cross-dresses um, in a cabaret show like this. But yeah. You can see, while this may be slightly toned down, the screenshot still is somewhat risque. Perhaps not as risque as you really would see in a cabaret. There is, I guess, a wide variety as far as the that there's people who never would go to a cabaret or a play and then there are people who do go to plays or cabarets and at a lot of plays uh, certainly are just topless particularly if you're in like las vegas and so you go to any show in vegas there's a decent chance you might see a topless lady at the very least you would see a busty lady in a outfit like this with 
the high cut thigh hip showing type outfit uh, but yeah there are definitely conservative people who don't come anywhere close to those forms of entertainment and would see even something like this and go this is too risque for a video game even though it is a video game for mature uh, rated people 17 and up minimum I believe is the age rating <clears throat> but yeah there is a increasing amount of censorship as the graphics get more detailed um, particularly being pushed by the ESRB which the ESRB is becoming less and less relevant as time goes on we do probably need a ESRB uh, now inherently if Best Buy stops selling video games if Walmart stops selling video games then the ESRB might just disappear completely that wouldn't be great because they're also the lobbying group that keeps the government from creating its own ratings board but the ESRB was also running E3 and getting most of their money from E3 so I don't know how they're going to slim down and become a much more efficient while cheaply paid for organization that they kind of need to be um, them modernizing their rating systems would be somewhat helpful but I, I imagine we we might see ESRB fail and then a new ratings board be formed or a, a voluntary system that's agreed amongst the industry without there actually being a ratings board at all in which everybody just self-reports their content. Um, but yeah, Walmart requires things to be rated by the ESRB to sell it. If Walmart stops selling video games then it really would just be Best Buy. I could see Best Buy saying, you know what, we're going to sell games that aren't rated by the ESRB, or we'll make our own rating system. Um, that happened for a long time before the Movie Picture Association, the MPAA, happened, and there was there was a ratings board by a different name, or it, it had a different name before then. But yeah. I think in particular the people that are reviewing ES, uh, games at ESRB are not evolving with the times. Um, Censored Gaming also um, talked about a mistranslation here in the original Final Fantasy 7 game where this, um, let's see if I can actually pull up this video for a second so we can just show what Final Fantasy 7 looked like originally. Uh, there is this underwear, um, pantsu is the word that would be used in Japanese, and it effectively was translated in the original version of the game as orthopedic underwear. Just a straight up mistranslation from the Japanese um, when it was. Um, the, the word was kind of stretching out and stretching tall is one interpretation of the word and I think that's where they got the word orthopedic from uh, was my understanding after watching this video but it was actually subtly hinting at the fact that the the underwear was a little too mature so you might have better localized it as sexy underwear or mature underwear mature would have been the better direct translation for the character because the character whose underwear it, it belongs to is um, is kind of underage of uh, 17 18 just like so here it says orthopedic underwear and they talk about the translation but mostly what I wanted to show here is that of Final Fantasy 7s. So he, he goes into full detail making a three minute video which honestly for censored gaming I think that makes a lot of sense to touch on one aspect in general 
of censorship each in each video instead of talking about multiple aspects of a game being censored um, hmm. there so my main point though is here's the little polygon um, where the arm is basically just one um, one polygon now here he continues to say that in the Japanese version the phrase Choto Shinobi Panchi uh, shino uh, is used and that might be a reference to the underwear uh, but in English it's just called a Jaeger jab or something and yeah you can definitely see how the graphics have gotten a lot better and this is the girl whose underwear it belongs to and there's another reference potentially to it in Dissidia Final Fantasy Dissidia 12 yeah and see she's like 17 or something so they're, they're saying a bit a bit much a bit too much which you look at her outfit and it, it all is a, a bit too much it's, it's all very much in that Japanese Final Fantasy style of fashion where she's wearing suspenders and a skirt and fairly large boots hmm. but yeah we're well, really scraping the bottom of the barrel from news Here's some real news. Uh, GameDeveloper.com has an obituary for Kamar de los Rias, a Call of Duty actor dying at the age of 56. Uh, he was a actor of TV and film, portrayed the Call of Duty Raul Menendez in Black Ops sub-series. Let's see if we have reason he had a brief battle with cancer which hmm dying from a brief battle of cancer implies to me he either didn't catch it anywhere close to time or killed himself um, because he had cancer which is definitely not the viable solution these days the treatment for cancer these days is way better than it was in the past and uh, you aren't just guaranteed that you would have to be on IV chemotherapy that would turn you into a zombie losing all of your hair uh, having brain cloud and being tired all the time uh, that may be the situation for a lot of people but it's not guaranteed to be that um, situation I saw a YouTube video talking about a drug called Keytruda that is working very well but also as being is gouging people for like two hundred thousand dollars for a treatment of Keytruda um, just ridiculously high priced a drug that was actually paid for and developed by public funds and so the United States government could take the patent away from the company that bought the companies that developed Keytruda if they chose to we'll have to see if they do something like that passing away on Christmas Eve too is actually a fairly random event if it's not a case that somebody chose to pass away on Christmas Eve the number of self-harm suicides in the Christmas season tends to go up statistically speaking um, uh, the friend star who died on in his hot tub on ketamine apparently he was taking ketamine therapy is there's a rumor going out that he was taking ketamine therapy to get off of other drug addictions the the problem there is you, you can't take ketamine and be in the hot tub at the same time or you're drawn or something else will happen so this might be that might be a rare situation where the story gets generally agreed on that somebody was trying to get off drugs and accidentally died 
in an attempt to recover. Um, the IGDA, I don't know if I really care so much about the IGDA. Um, uh, as far as their posts and things. Did put out a letter to the uh, a letter here from the executive director of the IGDA which yeah that is an interesting thought as far as why don't we see more of that from uh, other websites like, there, there really could be a letter from the editor as far as um, as far as from video games chronicle or gamatsu Gamatsu in particular really is only one games one guy so I th that's my understanding of it so a end of year letter kind of makes some sense but I've only seen it from the IGDA so far And yeah, we'll just clean up this as much as I think I can clean this up. There's clearly something here, but I can't click on it. So I'll have to leave it at that. Then we'll just make it a little bit bigger. And then we'll use another plugin to See if we can center things. See, the picture here is getting cut off with every extra indent. So, can do about that much. And I probably need to come down a little bit and then I can do about that much see that's probably a little too small there you go so that's about as good as I can get it as far as cleaning up the page just quickly generally scanning this a stronger together in games please donate today twitch channel sponsoring uh, more information about the campaign here donate today if you can again new year new developer sponsorship forms so he's definitely talking about getting money for the international game developer association the developers association Yeah. And see, overall, that's everything as far as big news. And yes, I didn't go through the games again. And I, I am going to just consistently have that be an issue as far as having a spending that extra time to go through all the games that came out in the last stream to make a curated experience but clearly it's the right move to do i'm just gonna have to force myself to do it i don't know if i really would want to play a game boy looking green green grayscale looking game this definitely looks like this is something that would be in VR but it 
It isn't. It's it's a dungeon renovation simulator game as compared to the other cleanup games that would be similar. Like power wash simulators, not even the the cleanup crew game from a few years. Viscera cleanup detail is the probably better one to recommend here. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Viscera cleanup crew actually has a DLC or a room that is a dungeon. Revenge of the Colon. Eh, I'm gonna say no. One of the things as far as the followers clean up and the wishlist clean up too is I'm gonna just increasingly add games to the library even if they're garbage games like because with the new options if I add a garbage game I can hide a game and private a game I, I assume you can both private and hide a game and then it would just be not visible if you can't actually hide a game there are at least ways to hide it from your library and just owning more games as a way of getting the wishlist and clean up and the fall lists cleaned up is definitely a possibility I still want it to be within some level of reason it, it needs to be a game that has at least 30 reviews that are mostly positive uh, and a game that I think there's some chance I'd actually want to play I don't want to fill my library with a garbage uh, truck full of terrible games Yes, I am still putting things on the fall list, but inherently I don't have to put it on the fall list if I just want to make a YouTube short on it. I'm only putting things on the fall list if I actively think I would play it. And it does seem like we're seeing a higher amount now of games, once again. And so... I think we'll probably get close to our normal rate of games and at some point once I get in the habit of actually curating these games I need to pull the trigger to start looking at adult games again because we really are at a point where we may be at the beginning of a revolution of adult games. One of the things that has been talked about quite a bit uh, this year is how terrible of a year it, it, it was for video games. There was just a very high number of AAA failures and buggy games and that might put push the ever maturing class of old uh, older players into seeking out different types of games and those different types of games might be adult games this is a tower defense game garbage um, and steam certainly seems to be setting up for a revolution as far as adult games now we're still having the problem here of this really I think is the exact same publisher doing this making these very low effort games and then releasing them without any uh, outside of the adult section without any mature content warning so if anything if I was really gonna care I would flag the games but why would I do that let I'll let somebody else do that I've only flagged one game for literally stealing content and even that didn't accomplish anything as far as I could tell. In fact it would be interesting to see if that game is still available on Steam. Um, but yeah, it really isn't the time just because YouTube doesn't want me talking about adult games for me to stop following the trends 
we're still seeing as we see an increase of games though you see a disproportionate amount of bad asset flip garbage efforts yep it definitely feels like for one reason or another that there is a higher percentage as more games come out that that the percentages shift <clears throat> which that does leave room certainly to say hey if last week there was a very high level of quality games and this week there's a higher level of garbage games can you throw that into some kind of algorithm or filter to flag some of these games and some of these publishers and and say your games are not high quality enough and very possibly there is a algorithm or filter that is looking at the garbage games and recognizing that they really should just never get any promotion at all this one's Korean only so I'm not gonna leave it on the fall list um, but certainly that's not gonna help people looking for new games or looking at games as they're coming out there there really needs to be kind of flag system before his steam store page goes for goes live but yeah increasingly like i didn't click anything to show me adult content i don't believe i did I, i've been I still have the same settings as I had before, and yet we have multiple 3D CGI adult asset flip games tagged with nudity and mature content and not safe for work. And all of those tags should say, put at least a warning that it's in the adult section and put it in the adult section. See, here's an example of a game that is rated very positively there's a decent chance i'd never really want to play a trading card game based off of basketball but whatever it's got over 30 reviews it's rated very positively it's free to play it might have some in-app purchases but doesn't really seem like it does any of that it doesn't have a third party account which that's something I probably need to pay more attention to it has a third party end user license agreement but it doesn't require you to sign into a third party account so in these cases this is the kind of situation where I should just click add to library and then that immediately eliminates it from needing to be in a wish list or the follow list and it automatically will remove it from the Wish list. It will not remove it from the follow list automatically, though. So, yeah, that's a different way. Certainly, to clean up things by potentially making a mess of having a Steam library. Although, in fairness, the games you've purchased in your Steam library are going to inherit inherently be a mess, anyways. There's just not enough assistance there to. Ni nicely, nicely organize everything. Um, you're, you're going to have to create a bunch of filters and libraries, and that is something that Steam could improve on, certainly, as far as having more dynamic libraries by default for new accounts and existing accounts. Suggested dynamic libraries really would help. If you could be if you went to your Steam library and it said we have a suggested dynamic library that would match these these games and put them all into the category of action games <clears throat> of course there, there's still a lot of work to do there as far as uh, it, it would be nice to have a dynamic library that could filter out based on not having certain tags like not safe for work if I could take all the games that have not safe for work and easily remove them from 
a dynamic library. That'd be nice, but I don't believe you can do a not search. You can only do a positive search that would be a list of all games with the not safe for work tag, which then that might give you a list to manually remove from other dynamic libraries and block, but that's not very scalable. This game here is probably nothing, but I'm going to give it a chance. This kind of animation, I just don't ever see how this kind of animation would really work. It just feels like somebody wants to make a video game when they can't really draw, so, and they can't find somebody to draw for him. Like, I just don't buy that as being a valid animation style. And we definitely are in a world where the likes of the Comedy Network and Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network and Toonami all have tried to push a significant amount of art styles that are not acceptable in the level of quality. The styles themselves might be acceptable, but the the first outing of showing us a, a style looks awful. And there are just some styles that aren't going to work at all. Like low polygons, highly unlikely to work uh, in any media factor, let alone in a video game. There, there are just a certain finite s styles that people expect and you could introduce and create something new but it would have to be highly highly polished. Uh, Aeon Flux or Neon Flux um, I think it was Aeon Flux was the name of it um, should I give this a chance I don't think so I think this is a joke game yeah Aeon Flux is kind of an example of that where it had a very distinctive style I think that style had a lot of polish to it but even at that, as the first outing, it was definitely rejected, and we've never really seen anything that has that sharp-edged, high fashion art nouveau, uh, French art nouveau, I think is what I'd describe it as. Maybe that's the wrong phrase uh, that Aeon Flux kind of had. It totally wasn't embraced. Although inherently, and Flux also being part of an animation block on MTV was very weird as far as a concept. We're almost done. And inherently, after filtering out what felt like a lot more garbage uh, this day, this would have all been up to like December 25th. Um, it really left just about the same amount of games. So here we have the following list once again loading. I probably need this to, just because of the way my macro goes, filter everything from the bottom up but inherently if I'm going to filter everything in the filter list and, and try and clean it up I'm gonna mess up my macro anyways and it's just gonna have to reset I'll probably pick somewhere in the middle to have it go and not just have it start on the A's once again hmm. but yeah there, there's still a fairly large list here of games even per letter so it does create this situation where even if I just try to open all the B's it opens quite a bit of of the um, quite a bit of the uh, what am I trying to say here
My macros are still very broken. It, it opens quite a bit of tabs. And right now, as I'm trying to find this, this one tab that has viruses on it, or the one website that has viruses on it, I'm trying to close tabs. Of course, I have a whole bunch of programming tabs that I'm still keeping open. Hmm. Okay, we'll probably be done fairly quickly here now. Let's see, as far as SteamDB and the 24 hour peak, it feels to me like we might be a little low on Counter Strike 2 around Christmas, which would make sense. It's still fairly high numbers overall, though. Still keeping the top 15 games and the 100,000 mark, even the number 16 with War Thunder. Maybe there was a Christmas event with War Thunder. Uh, people seem to still be playing the finals and Call of Duty, even though people hate that. Um, or at least it seems like people hate Call of Duty, although online people who are just playing player versus player may really be forced to play the most recent Call of Duty regardless. So if you like Call of Duty in general, you may be forced to play the most recent one. As far as my chart is going, seems like there was a little bit of a bump up here in all of this as Christmas went around. Uh, noticeably though, it doesn't seem like any new game would have been received in a large percentage, in, in, in an uneven percentage, to the point where people on Steam were playing some brand new game that they got for Christmas. I did see a Christmas posting where it was an empty box with a note in it saying, you know, my permission to buy a Steam Deck OLED version, which, yeah. That would have been a nice pre present, certainly, to receive. It was a husband getting it from a wife, getting permission. Um, and it certainly is an idea, certainly, is to just have a box that's empty uh, because a lot of these products, like the Steam Deck, have multiple versions of it, and the idea of buying the wrong version is fairly high. So, yeah. And it still would be viable January 4th as far as the winter sale going on it still probably would be very viable to buy a Steam Deck right now and potentially get a lot of points towards the trading cards which aren't really worth much of anything but if you bought a Steam Deck now and you didn't have a large amount of games if you've, if you've just never played games before um, on Steam now would be the time to buy a bunch of um, a bunch of new games I heard someone saying that Forspoken was in part why the previous Final Fantasy game uh, not 15 I think it was 14 didn't get some DLC that it really would have benefited from and so people were increasingly upset around Forspoken in that um, conversation where as far as just all the terrible games that were released this year Forspoken was one of them Steam gift cards I guess you could buy them and maybe get points from buying gift cards probably not no I imagine you get points for using the gift cards you don't get points for buying the gift cards otherwise you can buy gift cards and then double your points towards the trading cards but yeah there definitely are sales going on right now if you needed to build up your steam thing I, I would definitely say though if you're unless you just don't have a PC and you want to get into PC gaming buying a steam deck and games at the same time makes sense but if you have any kind of PC that can play any kind of games there's definitely a good amount of very old games you could play um, and on, on a PC first and build up your Steam account first and then get the Steam Deck a year later or when the next generation of Steam Deck, the Steam Deck 2 comes out, uh, I would definitely say you're better off owning the games than owning hardware that has a battery in it that will eventually um, fail and need to be re replaced. And 
a Steam Deck inherently does have hardware in it that's going to become outdated. Um, so it's not as long term of an investment as you hope purchasing a game would be on Steam. I also heard somebody talking about how, uh, I think this was a DF Retro video, that the most recent Final Fantasy game compared to the most recent Yeez game are fairly different in the ease is actually challenging and the most recent Final Fantasy game is laughably um, easy and thus not particularly enjoyable because it's too easy. Um, as far as actual video games chronicle news I think my Mac will probably um, is working fairly well. Ghostwire Tokyo is available at the Epic Games Store. Users have 24 hours to close to see it. This probably is already gone. December 25th, yeah. This was a couple days ago, so they kind of stopped updating the free games. It doesn't even matter to me now, the free games on the Epic Store. I'm very consistently getting rejected by the um, CAPTCHA system on the Epic Games Store. And I just don't really know a way or what's causing it to be a problem there I probably need to open the page in a private browser and figure out if one of my plugins is being detected by the captcha as it as a problem and then happy holidays from video games chronicle so seems like they've just taken the whole time off and don't have anything new to say whereas Gamatsu has Tekken 8's Kuma gameplay Kuma being the Japanese word for bear I believe um, so, yeah, that looks new. The Famitsu review scores for issue 1831 are out. Only reviewing two games, Avatar Frontiers of pa Pandora getting 36 out of 40, 40, which is pretty good. And then Custom Mech Warrior <laughs> War is getting 28 out of 40, which is pretty low. Weird that they chose to use Custom Mech Wars as the screenshot. Then we talked about Full Metal Alchemist Mobile to end service. Cyberstep announces a visual novel to the top, Otto no Ijin Tachi, featuring YouTubers Nikki and more from the PS4, Switch, PC, iOS, and Android. Which basically is, is an early announcement for something out in the spring of 2024. Move Love and Move Love Alternate for Switch launches March 28th in 2024. I think we'd probably been announced, told, that these visual novels were going to come to the Switch. Move Love is definitely a series that I recognize the name. It is a pretty recognizable name. And so, yeah, anything that is fairly successful or even slightly successful seems like it's going to be released on the switch at least in japan um, there's a 20th odyssey box available in japan um, which is probably a bundle and collector's edition of the two games a dragon quest tact global version is going to end service on february 29th of 2024 um, noticeably some of these things are ending before the fiscal year ends so um, February 31st basically and January February maybe March 31st is the end of the fiscal year the first uh, first three months the first quarter of uh, a year so yeah they, they don't want to file taxes or have their fiscal records include any expenses or profits from mobile games that they're not really willing to support anymore. Yeah. And that is part, partly my argument around the Game Awards or some kind of People's Choice Game Awards happening around that same time where it would be March of the year that you start to talk about all the games that came out between January and December of the previous year. And 
I kind of want to make a video, but I almost certainly won't do it. Don't have time, don't have, really have the skill to do it. Where we really need to, as gamers, abandon the tyranny of the top 10 lists. Uh, it's ridiculous how much time I spent listening to old Bombcast uh, podcasts in the past years. Um, where they would just argue on, we need a top 10, we need a top 3. Um, when this year in particular really makes a great argument that, that there really isn't room for a lot of categories to have a top 10 or a top 3. Some some action games, there might be 20 action games worth talking about. There might only be one. There might be none some years. And so we, we need to get away from the limitations of saying there must be a top 3 list. There must be a top 10. There must be a winner and a runner-up and a second runner-up. Although we almost never use those phrases. Um, it, it It's just ridiculous to situate everything around 10 in particular because it's a round number. Um, and it only creates a situation where people are then struggling to talk about things that they want to talk about that don't quite make the top 10, which happened a lot in the Giant Bombcast end of the year podcast audio events in previous years. Um, um, and then there it creates this forced narrative where people feel the need to talk about games that they otherwise wouldn't have wanted to talk about. Uh, I'd rather have people who are generally passionate talk about things they have passion for whether that is one game per year or three games per year or 10 year 10 games or 11 games it, it doesn't really matter we, we want genuine passion uh, around video game reviews and end of the year wrap-ups instead of people uh, uh, arbitrarily holding to lists and listicles just because that's what other websites and other magazines used to do in the past I mean, it's a, it's dumb just to stick to tradition for no reason. Inherently, when you ask a little kid about what games they played that year, they're probably only going to remember two or three of them at most, and they're going to be more than likely excited about one game, and they'll talk your year off that one game. And that's the genuine passion that we get from kids who are actually playing video games, younger kids, that we should be seeing from mainstream video game journalists and reviewers and critics in general uh, is that people should talk about things they're really passionate about. I played 33 games this year. I can't remember most of them. I genuinely enjoyed probably several of them while playing them, but I can't really remember any of them. I'd have to refresh myself. Uh, and I definitely didn't enjoy a lot of them that I did play. Um, which that increasingly seems to be the case. Uh, but I do think I enjoyed Prey Moon Crash. So if I was going to, off the top of my head, talk about any game this year that I had passion in and enjoyed, I would say I, I really enjoyed Prey Moon Crash. I really didn't enjoy Prey proper, uh, the non-DLC. Uh, and I wish that the level design around Prey proper had the gameplay mechanics of moon crash more often um, then I think that would have been a better experience or at least some of the gameplay mechanics of prey moon crash um, I found Legend of Bumbo which is airing on my channel right now to be a little frustrating I think I did play some Binding of Isaac Rebirth this year I probably enjoyed that quite a bit since I chose to go back and play it um, but a lot of games I played this year definitely were more for historical look look back reasons. Mist 5. Maybe I enjoyed Mist 5 a little bit better the second time I've played it now. Uh, because I think the first time I played it, I probably had a, a very underpowered computer, uh, relatively speaking. And I imagine I had a lot more stuttering problems. But Mist 5 in, to in general is not... A, not a great game but yeah I'd, I'd really have to go back and look at my list to see the other games in general that I even covered because they're definitely worse of 
that I played. Uh, Dicey Dungeons was something I thought I would enjoy, but it became repetitive and grindy. And yeah, Momento Mori on my mobile phone has been the game I've had the most passion about and actually talked about and played. And that's not something I've even made footage on, uh, which I, I do want to see that happen at some point too, is to be able to create something where I can create videos while playing on mobile, um, which either means Google Play's emulation or Microsoft Windows emulation of Android needs to get a lot better this year, or I just need to build in Raspberry Pi 5 and put Android on that and make footage that way, which, yeah, that might be a project in the future to do is just make a Raspberry Pi that runs Android and then I can play video games on that to make footage and then take the footage and move it over to my main computer to upload at that point. I mean OBS is Linux based so you probably could uh, I don't know if you really could use OBS though on Android that that might actually be very difficult uh, it might be a case where I have to VPN into an Android Raspberry Pi build and then that might look very badly I don't know I don't, I'd have to think about that more but that that is a thought that just came off the top of my head and certainly if I started covering mobile games there would be fewer people who are streaming mobile games probably could just screenshot and stream off my cell phone mobile games if I wanted to uh, moving on as we're gonna wrap up here very quickly Persona 3 Reload has a daily life tra trailer if you want to check that out on Gamatsu and then Tokimiki Memorial Girls side first love second season and third story are coming to switch on February 14th in Japan um, so three more visual novels coming to the switch which yeah I imagine we'll see more of that particularly as they approach Valentine's Day and then Frontier Mission first remake mercenaries update announced adds new single-player scenarios local multiplayer mode and more and that seems like that was the article that we ended on last stream so it feels like my macro fixed itself and we'll look at gamedeveloper.com which is broken let's see new rockstar leak reveals gta code and cancelled studio projects let's look at that vr developer first con con contact closes down and then we're kind of back to nothing's between that time december 22nd to december 26th and i still suspect these are the this is the website that has the virus on it would be my guess and there is a full fall list cleanup that actually loaded so I think by removing even a few games I got back under that level um, but I'm not gonna do a fall list cleanup on screen probably ever like uh, I think that that's a waste of time to do it on screen I should just do it off screen save my vet save my throat uh, here's the gamedeveloper.com article. New Rockstar leak reveals GTA code, canceled studio projects. Source code for GTA 5 was leaked, revealed now scrapped projects like Story DLC and Bully 2 were in development. Um, I think what they got from this is that there was as many as like five DLCs that were scrapped from GTA 5. Yeah. Which, yeah, seems like this code leak could reveal quite a bit. Now, inherently, did anybody need to steal the code to make a GTA clone? No. And if you were going to make a GTA clone now, you have to bend over backwards to not look at this code. Because if you look at it and they can prove it in court, then Rockstar, who are very likely to sue you, um, could use that as a case of you stole their code and... and rip them off um, you don't need that code certainly to make 
a GTA style game. A lot of the code would just be Unreal Engine or Unity Engine built in mechanics and then you just gotta make a 3D world and have a bunch of cars and interactions with cars and other things and inter interactions with people. There's really no reason why GTA couldn't be replaced with a different company's clone of GTA very quickly and Saints Row in a lot of ways did that they just went more comedy if the original makers of the Saints Row games that are good decided to make a, a more serious GTA game they could do it fairly easily I would suspect and then these were a couple of games that I saw on sale these are older games but I'm gonna put them on the follow list Although, why am I even putting a 2020 game on the fall list? I just need to decide whether I think this game is good enough to put on the wish list and put it on the wish list. And I think it is, so I will put it on the wish list as far as a laser puzzle game with some color elements. And then this one from 2021, Turing Complete, is overwhelmingly positive. It's not very visual, but it's a programming game, so. I will add that to the wish list unless it's free. Hmm. Well, the problem here is it's early access. So I see why it's still on the fall list. And I haven't given any thought as far as should I put things that are early access on the wish list or just buy things that are in early access if I think they're close enough to being done. Mostly I've been very very sternly saying I'm not willing to play something labeled as early access um, regardless of whether it looks good or not. Anyways, that's going to be it for this show. We, we again have managed to keep this around two hours instead of going three or four hours and it would have even been shorter had I pre-curated the games from last stream that's going to be it for this stream as always i ask you to like share subscribe comment and watch every second of my videos if you want to support me further there's a link down below in the description box thank you for watching have a good evening